Coming up today, Korea's ruling party sets out its policy priorities to the National Assembly. The floor leader says cooperation is the key word for progress, especially now there are three major parties, not just two. Korea exhibits its Government 3.0 initiative, which uses technology to customise services and to enhance communication between the people and the government. First, the first opinion polls on the EU referendum since the murder of MP Joe Cox suggest the Remain campaign is pulling back into the lead. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello, it's noon on Monday, the 20th of June. You're tuned in to our midday newscast here on Adidang TV. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. We are going to begin at Korea's National Assembly, where the floor leader of the ruling Senate Party briefed the parliament on his party's policy priorities. It's his first parliamentary address since taking office earlier this month. For more, we are going to connect to our Jim Young Gil, who's on the line for us at the National Assembly. So, Myung Gil, what did we glean from the floor leader's remarks? Hello, Mark. During his speech, Senate Party floor leader Cheong jin Seok advocated for the passage of a package of four labor reform bills to prop up Korea's stagnant economy. He said if passed, it will help provide job opportunities for young people and the elderly and expand unemployment benefits to help the unemployed. The opposition parties and labor unions, however, believe the bills undermine job security and give employers too much leeway to hire irregular workers. Chung also called for corporate restructuring of ailing companies to improve their financial soundness and minimize the fallout if they fail. He said without drastic restructuring to cut costs, the Korean economy could be in danger. The floor leader also promised to stamp out corruption across all levels of society. Right, so myung -gil, those are the economic priorities then. What else is on the party's to-do list? Well, Mark Chung also says South Korea should strengthen the alliance with the U.S. to counter North Korea's nuclear ambitions. He said the U.S. is capable of providing Seoul with a nuclear umbrella to guard against any provocations from Pyongyang. He also said his party supports South Korea's efforts to fully implement the U.N. sanctions on North Korea and keep up with international moves to impose additional sanctions on the North. Concerning the recent threats made by the Islamic State militant group against South Korea, Chung said the new counterterrorism center under the prime minister's office will act as a control tower against terrorist threats to safeguard the country and its citizens. He said the center will conduct around-the-clock surveillance on potential threats and set up contingency plans. The interim leader of the main opposition, Minju Party of Korea, Kim Jong-un, will brief the parliament on his party's priorities on Tuesday. An Chosu, co-leader of the minor opposition People's Party, will address the assembly on Wednesday. Back to you, Mark. Thank you, Myungil. So I guess we'll be hearing from uh, Myungil again on Tuesday and Wednesday as well. Now, in other news, South Korea's tech-led Government 3.0 initiative has been taking hold throughout the nation. To that end, the government is holding an expo showing all the results in one place. President Park Geun-hye said she hoped innovation would better contribute to the people's happiness. Our presidential office correspondent Song ju Son reports. Government at your fingertips. That's the slogan for the Government 3.0 Expo, held to better help the public understand how the initiative is implemented in their everyday lives. Communication and collaboration has been the key in launching the government's automated immigration system, a simplified annual tax return system, and one-stop services for inheritance matters and childbirth. President Buck also vowed smarter administration through cloud computing, Internet of Things and big data, while allowing the public greater access to those resources.
President Bach stressed that all innovation should be directed at making a nation where the people are happy, and she vowed that her administration will continue to work towards catering customized services for each and every person. Song ji -sang, Arirang News. Now, South Korea's defense ministry is standing by its crackdown on illegal Chinese fishing in neutral waters around the Hangang River estuary after North Korea slammed South Korea and the UN command for the operation. The ministry said Monday that the operation does not break any laws and abides by the armistice agreement that brought an end to the hostilities in the Korean War. It also said the military is ready to counter any threats or provocations from North Korea in the West Sea. This all came after earlier in the day, the North state-run Korean Central News Agency called the operation a military provocation and warned the missions could spark another artillery attack, just like the 2010 shelling of Yongpyongdo Island. The agency added that North Korea previously warned South Korea and the U.S. that any intrusion into its land, air or sea would be punished. It was the first response by North Korea since South Korea and the U.N. command began their crackdown earlier this month. Now, in economic news, South Korea's producer prices remained unchanged in May from a month ago as a drop in utility and agricultural product prices offset the rise in prices of petroleum products. The Bank of Korea says prices of farm produce were down more than 4% last month from April. Utility prices dropped almost 2%. On the other hand, industrial products rose half a percent. The increase follows global oil prices picking up pace with Dubai crude which is Korea's benchmark, rising over 10% in May from a month earlier. Compared to a year earlier, producers' prices dropped 3% last month. Campaigning for this week's Brexit vote in the UK has restarted following a temporary suspension following the tragic murder of a British politician late last week. The first opinion polls on the EU referendum since the killing of Joe Cox suggest the Remain campaign is pulling back into the lead. Kim Mulgian reports. The campaign to decide Britain's membership of the European Union resumed on Sunday after a three-day hiatus following the murder of Labour Party MP Joe Cox on Thursday. With the latest incident, polls suggest people in Britain are leaning towards staying in the European Union. According to a telephone survey conducted on Friday and Saturday by market research firm Servation, 45 percent of respondents said they wanted Britain to stay in the EU. 42 percent said they wanted to leave. This is a turnaround from the results of the firm's previous poll released a day before Cox's death. An online survey held by research firm YouGov on Thursday and Friday also revealed 44 percent wanted to remain and 43 percent wanted to leave. The results also swung from YouGov's poll held last Monday when the figure for those who supported Brexit was seven percentage points higher. Government officials from the Leave campaign were out in full force urging people to vote for a better future outside of the European Union. My view is that those challenges will be easier to meet, those risks will be less if we vote to leave because we will have control of the economic levers. We'll have control over money that we currently send to the European Union. We'll have control over our own laws. The British Prime Minister admitted there are issues with immigration, but said Britain must remain in the EU for a brighter future. What I'd say very frankly is that there are good ways of controlling immigration, and these welfare changes I think are good ways. There are bad ways of controlling immigration, and that I think would be leaving the single market, damaging our economy, costing jobs, and hurting British working families okay. in the process. Next. Worldwide attention is focused on which way Britain votes on Thursday, as regardless of the decision, it would have big implications for the future of the EU. Kim Mogyan, Arirang News. Now, the world is making a gradual shift away from coal to renewable energy sources. According to BP's Statistical Review of World Energy, global coal consumption fell by 1.8% in 2014 from the year before, well below the 10-year average annual growth of 2.1%. Coal consumption among OECD countries fell below 1,000 tonnes for the first time in 33 years in 2015 and saw a 12.2 per cent drop from 2010. Coal consumption in the United States has dropped by 24.5 per cent since 2010 
while the figure for European countries was between 9% and 45%. On the other hand, South Korea and China both saw their coal consumption rise by over 10% during the five-year period, and India saw an increase of 40%. Now, the ultra-fine dust plaguing Korea originates from sources both at home and abroad. The findings go against the Korean government's assertion that the pollution comes solely from China. Our Shin Se-min with this report. Men and women, young and old, line up for checkups. It's an increasingly common sight in pulmonology wards across Korea given the worsening air quality around the nation. The number of patients with respiratory diseases has surged in recent weeks and months, and many more come after a period of bad air quality. Most of the patients we see are elderly. A study by the Korea Environment Institute found that the number of inpatients with respiratory diseases rises more than 1 percent on days of elevated fine dust levels. Ultra-fine dust, particles smaller than 2.5 micrometers, or PM2.5, can also cause heart disease, strokes, and lung cancer. And a recent study shows that this particle-laden smog, if not curved, could result in premature deaths of up to 2,800 per year by 2021. International experts categorize fine dust as a first-degree carcinogen. A joint study by Greenpeace and Harvard University found 30 to 50 percent of the smog in Korea is due to China's industrialization and the resulting fine dust and yellow sand. The rest comes from Korea. Studies show Korea's 53 coal power plants and 20 million vehicles contribute heavily to the problem. For one, that thick layer of smog in Seoul largely comes from Korea's west coast, where half of the nation's coal plants are concentrated. Korea's environment ministry has announced special measures to curb levels of fine dust, calling for a reduction in the number of old coal fire power plants and diesel cars. But Korea, the world's fourth largest coal importer, has pledged to build a dozen more by 2021 with 11 already under construction. Nitrogen oxides, a contributor to lung-damaging ozone and fine dust from vehicles, accounts for around a third of the pollution in Korea. Outdoor incinerators, oil refineries and painting facilities all contribute to air pollution. It's just that there's no definitive measurement to determine the level of danger just yet. Experts are urging the government to grasp the causes of the air pollution and come up with carefully considered response measures. It may include relying less on coal and looking into renewable energy sources while taking steps to encourage people to leave their cars at home. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Three years have passed since Korea enacted a law to guarantee that the growing number of refugees in the country are protected. However, it's still not clear whether the law is actually playing a role in helping these refugees get by in their day-to-day -day lives. Lee Min Young explains. More than 5,000 refugees have sought asylum in Korea as the end of 2015, a nearly two-fold annual increase from two years before. In July 2013, South Korea became the first Asian country to enforce the Independent Refugee Act to guarantee the minimum level of humanitarian protection for refugees in Korea. Almost three years have passed since the act came to effect, but still, much more remains to be done. The law ensures asylum seekers receive benefits such as monthly living expenses, government housing and a special visa so they can work while their claims are being processed. However, some refugees aren't happy, saying there's a disconnect between what's in the law and reality. I did not get recognized yet, and it's almost five years for me. And I know people staying for seven years, eight years. And that's really painful for a refugee to get through all this process. Even after obtaining refugee status, most discover that finding a secure job isn't easy. As they have GM visa, which is really strange and new to the many employers, they are very hesitant to give the, um, give, have a uh, work contract with the refugee applicants. So. As a result, many refugees are reaching out to civic groups instead of the government for help. 
they help or they help me also for a few stuffs of life, uh, like rice. They have to give me sometimes some small transportation fee if I have to move. Experts agree the Refugee Act is not a quick fix, and there is certainly room for improvement. In future, what you need to see, I would like to see is bringing government and civil society closer in actually doing this work jointly as much as it is uh, done uh, or very much uh, as it is done in, in other uh, developed countries. Aware of the problems, the Ministry of Justice is mapping out plans to do better, including a plan to triple the funds for refugees' living expenses from the amount two years ago. Lee Min Young, Arirang News. Now in sports news, Korean golfer Kim Se-young won the Mayer LPGA Classic in the U.S. state of Michigan on Sunday, securing her second victory of the year and fifth overall on the LPGA Tour. Tying with Carlotta Siganda after bogeying the 18th hole, Kim had to raise her game in a tense playoff. Fortunately for Kim, she defeated her Spanish rival with a birdie on the first hole. The world's number five is likely to get a boost to her ranking with this victory. She has also virtually secured her ticket to the Rio Olympic Games in August. Now, the rainy season is due to start in Korea this week. Showers are forecast in southern regions, including Jeolla Namdo and Gyeongsam Namdo provinces on Monday due to the influence of a seasonal band of rain. Up to 60 millimetres of precipitation is expected to fall on Korea's southern Jeju Island. The rain is expected to spread nationwide by Thursday, uh, by Tuesday evening, rather. In Korea's central regions, we're going to have hot temperatures and high humidity, with a daytime high peaking at 33 degrees in Daegu. A word of warning, Though. With the exception of southern and southwestern regions, most of the country will be under bad ozone, with levels reaching a peak between 2 and 5 p.m. Well, those are stories we've been following on this Monday afternoon here in Seoul. For more of the latest, don't forget to check out the website, arirang.com forward slash news. Have a great day. Goodbye.